All right, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Save by the 3PL episode. We are really excited to uh, be hosting this with a great panel today um, full of people that are really well versed in supply chain and inventory management. I'm gonna go real fast through the panel and kind of touch on what we'll be talking about. We have Pearl Ausch, which I just learned her last name. I think I said it right this time, right? <laughs> Pearl, you got it right. <laughs> I know that. She'll be talking about um, inventory and the best ways to manage shipments. Um, we have James McConnell, who uh, owns a um, the market place or market prep place, right? Am I saying it right? Uh, Marketplace prep. Okay, sorry, my dyslexia is kicking in. <laughs> um, so he owns um, warehouses as well, and recently wrote a really good blog about what's happening with the restock limits um, regarding FBA. So I definitely want to talk to him about that, as well as Chelsea Cohen, who owns So Stocked, and uh, she also has a lot of insights with regards to what's happening with the managing inventory levels in FBA. Um, we have Tim Jordan, who uh, everyone knows, and he will kind of be interjecting his opinions in all of this, but mostly focusing on how all of this will affect your, um, if you don't manage your inventory correctly, especially going into Q4, how this will affect your ranking, your buy box, and your reviews. Um, we have Jeff C. Stock with 3PL Zen. He will be um, talking about uh, the options between um, third-party warehouses as opposed to FBA and how um, those will benefit you in a lot of ways regarding the inventory limits. And of course, um, Sajag we have here and he'll be talking about inspections and how uh, doing proper inspections will actually help the process regarding shipments, management, and not um, having backlog. Um, and Miss Amy also recently did a, did you say a podcast about um, logistics on this topic? Uh, we talked in um, in a few different forums about how to prep your logistics for Q4 and how to deal with your suppliers and um, get kind of to the front of the line and what you need to do. So I'll be talking about that today. Perfect. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, everyone watching should have a well balanced and uh, pretty wide um, understanding of the logistics and supply chain of things. I think we'll just start off talking about what's happening with the restock limitations. Um, I think a lot of people misunderstand that as um, inventory management or inventory limitations. Um, J James, why don't you kind of explain the difference between the two and how they actually measure um, how they measure restock limits. Absolutely. So um, as you mentioned, I wrote a blog article. I just pulled it up for my reference. Um, and it was kind of like, okay, starting off with clarifying the confusion of what these are. Uh, because Amazon implements stuff, and sometimes they are not the best at explaining it <laughs> and as we all know amazon can be very unpredictable so we have to either read between the lines or do tests and figure out on our own and um, since i'm not only a 3po owner but also a seller so i got both ends of the spectrum and i got lots of different not only perspectives but also data points that saying hey this is happening here but this is happening here we had different scenarios with large sellers small sellers um, and we were able to pinpoint some things that kind of just made sense in regards to restock limits are kind of their own thing. So they're not tied to cubic or volumetric storage. This is probably the most common thing that people are getting confused about because they say, oh, I have unlimited storage. I can only send in 200 units. Ain't that ironic. <laughs> um, cubic and volume is like com versus unit volume is like comparing your, I don't know, your six feet tall and you weigh 150 pounds. Well, they're two totally different metrics that measure two totally different things. So you can be heavier or lighter, taller or shorter, but they're, they're kind of independent from each other. Um, they're also not tied to IPI scores. 
Uh, obviously, if you have really lean inventory, you tend to have naturally good limits and naturally good scores. But ultimately, I did an analytic study on dozens of sellers um, and plotted a bunch of points. And IPI was not a correlation point. Uh, they're not random. Um, we've seen most sellers fall within a trend line. Um, Non-US marketplaces, so Canada, um, I'm sorry, but Canada got hit really, really bad. Um, same thing with UK, so their limits are much more restrictive than the US. Um, they're not based on gross sales volume. So if you sell $100 products or if you sell $10 products, it's about unit volume. So it doesn't really matter. Oh, I just sold more today. Well, did you sell more units or did you just sell more dollars? Um, the restock recommendations um, tab that Amazon shows you is not tied in with restock limits. You can change your settings on the restock recommendations tab if you don't have a forecasting software. And they are, you can customize those to be tighter and smaller or larger and bigger. Uh, and then the last thing is it's not just about selling more. If it was selling more, that it wouldn't really solve the problem for Amazon. Amazon is, doesn't have enough space and doesn't have enough people. So what Amazon wants is they don't want you to just sell more product. They want you to sell more for a given amount of space that they store. So turnover. Uh, and a lot of people don't understand turnover. And that's kind of where I, I dove into it. And I said, look, you need to treat Amazon not as your warehouse, but as a retail store. If you were going to sell some stuff at Walmart, you're not going to store a container worth of stuff at Walmart. You're going to store a container worth of stuff at your warehouse, your house, whatever, and then send Walmart 10 cases or whatever. Right. Um, and Chelsea, you recently, what was like three days ago, um, you went live with some pretty interesting information, which kind of changed the, I don't know if it changed the name of the game, and I don't know if it's even been confirmed yet, but I really um, wanted to share, I wanted you to share with the audience what your findings were and how it relates to this. Yeah, um, I mean, there's a couple of things that we could touch on, and I'm sure we'll get into that later in the, the call, but specifically what I was talking about on that live had to do with restock limits and had to do with MCF or multi-channel fulfillment. So, um, what ended up kind of happening is I woke up to one of our so stock users who's a friend of mine, his, um, his restock limits doubled overnight and he got an email specifically explaining to him why they had doubled overnight. And the email essentially talked about uh, MCF. The MCF team had decided that they wanted to double his restock limits and allow him to send more inventory in for his off Amazon channels. So what essentially was happening when the restock limits came into play, a lot of sellers decided, including this seller, that they were going to pull their MCF and no longer send their other channels through Amazon so they could free up that space to use for Amazon sales. And so Amazon, you know, you would think that Amazon would want that to happen so that they could move just Amazon product through. But in my estimation, Amazon actually did not like that that data point was removed. They actually want that data. So they want to know how much of, you, of your business is going through Shopify, how much of your business is going through all of these other platforms. So when that occurred, they decided that they wanted the MCF to be part of the restock limits. So MCF is part of restock limits, uh, FBA is part, or FBM is part of restock limits, and these are things that people don't know. The Your sales velocity is bolstered by your MCF sales and by your FBM sales. So in, in, in getting this email that came through, he was basically given double the space and, you know, and then told that if this is not enough space, you can write to a specific email address and I can uh, provide that email address. You can drop it into uh, you know, the comments or whatever, um, a specific email address to request more. And um, all you need to do is you need to submit you know, your 90 day. This is gonna be, uh, this is gonna be, this restock limit is going to be available to you to the end of the third quarter. And then they're going to reassess if you deserve this amount 
for the fourth quarter. And so moving into the fourth quarter, essentially what he needs to do and what anyone who has this needs to do in the third quarter is to pump up your sales. And they ask for you to submit, if you're going to submit a request of an additional amount beyond the, you know, the increase that they give you, you need to simply lay out um, what you're, you plan on selling for that quarter and say, okay, this is the amount. And I actually talked to another friend of mine after that live and they had submitted on a monthly basis per channel what they were expecting to sell, including FBM or FBA. They wanted FBA as well. So mm. if you've been, you know, my, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, I don't really do a lot uh, on other channels. Well, if you've been holding back on your marketing because you don't have enough space, then just tell them you need this much space and really push your marketing in the third quarter and push it as, as hard and as fast as possible so that you can prove to them that by the fourth quarter, you're going to need more space. So was it as simple as like if they withdrew um, their multi-channel fulfillment automatically that raised a flag for Amazon and so they were essentially like giving them uh, initiative to come back or I mean to I we mean don't, how yeah. Yeah. we don't know enough about that yet I'm still trying to get more data and and talking to some people um, to see if I can get some some more inside data so. We're going to continue to kind of update on this, but we don't exactly know because we don't have enough people coming forward saying that this has happened to them. I know two people now. And so if anyone does know, they can come to me and give me more data and we can start compiling more kind of case studies on what are those specifics that granted that. But there is an email that they did provide now that you know, we're basically, you know, have kind of put out and some people are going to be contacting and seeing if they can get into that program or not just simply by requesting it. So we, I haven't heard back yet, but we'll see if, uh, if that comes to fruition. So Chelsea, I have a quick follow-up question to that. So when they increase the storage limits for MCF multi-channel fulfillment, that yeah. storage space can be used for anything, right? It can also be used for Amazon sales, not just yep. necessarily MCF. Yes, exactly. Because because when they tell you, you know, hey, request if you need more storage than what we just gave you, request it and let us know uh, what your projections, not your past history, but your projections for the next 90 days for MCF and FBA. So also, if you have products that you're, you know, you're not launching because you don't have enough room, it's kind of like right now, if you can get them to increase your limit, then just go hog wild and try to launch the products that you're trying to launch to you know, boost the sales that you haven't been able to do because you haven't had the room. Because in at the end of the day, you know, if you can get your FBA sales up um, as well, then that will help your push into the fourth quarter. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people with, um, you know, contain, well, I know I have several clients with container loads of product, of new products on their way to Amazon and they can't, send them in because their restock limits are based on their first SKU, which it was very successful, but now they don't have the space to get back in stock of their best SKU and launch three more SKUs and variations because Amazon is only re uh, looking at the restock levels as um, that one product, right? So far what they've sold. So I'm sure there's a lot of folks that are in this, okay, I'm ready for Q4. I've tested all my products. I'm ready to go. I've got containers on the way and they're just stuck. Um, so I think that these points to understand your restock limits is really good and to do what you can do about your restock limits is good. But also it's good that we have all these people on the panel because you're going to need a 3PL. You're going to need to understand um, how to seed feed Amazon so that you can get better restock limits in the future. Right. Uh, because I can't imagine that everyone is going to be able to use this MCF loophole that you've recently discovered. And I think all of us need to be ready and prepared to deal with our inventory, both in Amazon and outside of Amazon, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I I this is a question for you, Amy. So it would seem and I think you mentioned this in your blog, James, is that it seems like the quick solution is order less but do it more often and my question and this goes to pearl as well how does that you know with the backlog 
of shipping and cargo and all that stuff and the ports like how does these new restock limits affect how you're going to order your products and how you're going to ship them out and how you time that so that especially coming on to q4 that it's a like ever you know moving solution that's not going to be held up in any you know place well i think i think we're in the middle of a double-edged sword right now because you know we're about to get into a, a q4 like no other um there's more people shopping online than ever before because of the pandemic and because of that as well there's a huge shipping backlog and it's caused shipping rates to go way up. So already shipping is expensive and ordering less more often, especially if it's coming from China with the lead times and everything is not the solution. In fact, most of us are ordering six months worth of, in worth of inventory and we know we have to have it shipped by August. And so what that means is for most of us that have larger amounts of inventory that are ordering container loads at a time, what that means for us is that we sh we order as much as we need, right, to get us through six months. We get it here to America, and then we deal with logistics partners here in America so that we're able to, like I mentioned, seed feed Amazon, get our stuff to deliver to go through our other sales channels like Walmart and Sears and stuff like that. Um, or even on our own website, using multi-channel fulfillment like Chelsea mentioned. Uh, but the, the bottom line is the inventory needs to be here. Now, some things you can do with your supplier to reduce your costs is you can, if you need to order more from your supplier and order it because raw material costs in some cases are going up. So you might need to order more from your supplier and leave it with your supplier. So you maybe ship out four months of inventory now and you leave the rest with your supplier, but maybe you have your supplier go ahead and do production for an entire year of inventory. And I wouldn't recommend that for brand new products that we're just starting out on, but for those products that you've got going and you know are going, you know, you know your inventory estimates, you know your sales estimates, get those things inspected, make sure they're good to go and let your supplier hang on to them and then ship them at regular intervals and utilize your logistics. Can I interject a bit on that? Yeah. I typically agree with you, except for Q4, because we know that cost and availability go up in Q4. So if if any of you are listening, you're thinking, okay, this makes perfect sense. If I'm selling out, um, or, or I can do you know 90 day runs, order 90 days worth, and then after a certain period of time, order another 90 days. You actually need to compress that when you get closer to Q4 because not only are costs going up but right now there's just no freaking containers and there's no there's no planes. yeah so yeah, like I, I want to mention, if you have any inventory you need for q4 you better ship it right now yeah and that's why right, that's why i said like right now six months of inventory get it out the door by august yeah. right but like when you get past q4 and we're starting to you know then you can play around but thanks for clarifying that tim yeah, I, I heard you say it, but I wanted to make sure everybody <laughs> heard it a second time because there's so many people people right now like, you know, it's just so much bad content and people just regurgitate stuff and they, you know, just like repeat stuff they've heard. And like I've seen people putting out, you know, in Facebook groups lately. Oh, yeah, your supplier will hold stuff for you. You know, just get on a ship a little bit every two months and people are doing that. And I'm like, you guys are you guys are wrong. <laughs> You're going to screw this up for everybody because. Nobody's considering Q4 and the complete dumpster fire that we're about to run into. Yeah. I, I just want to add one thing because I heard this last night. I was at the networking event, the powwow event. I don't know if anybody uh, anybody else heard of it. But I was there last night. And while you know I was talking to other fellow freight forwarders, we ourselves don't offer sea freight. Our specialty is small parcel. But I did hear that containers are going up to 18,000. So yeah. to, Tim's, to Tim's point, bringing in right now everything is going to be madness total madness besides for not being able to get space the price is just astronomical it, it makes no sense um so hopefully it goes down you know once once we get past the mad rush so sajak um because amy brought up making sure you get all of your stuff in line ready prepped and out the door that kind of um, puts a lot of pressure on the inspection process, right? So 
the question becomes in your um, specialty and your understanding of it, what would you recommend in terms of making sure your inspections are thorough enough, but they're also being done at um, relatively good speed so that you know we're getting stuff out the door? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think uh, a lot of it comes down to risk tolerance. So just as Amy was saying, if you have like a new product, uh, sending out like six months of inventory all at once is really risky. Uh, because if there are problems with the inventory, if there are issues with the product, a lot of times that gets shown in the first one or two orders. So if you're having those kind of problems on your first order and you have, you know, six months of inventory that you've shipped out, uh, you know, that can be really risky and you can lose a lot of money in that order. So what that basically means for new product launches is that new product launches might be elongated a little bit. So, you know, if you're looking to launch a product, it may not be, um, you know, a three month timeline now might be more like a six month timeline. So if you have new products that you guys want to launch in the next you know, year or so, you might want to get started on those projects a little bit sooner rather than later. So you can get that inventory, get a couple of test orders out, have time for shipping, have time to sell it, and make sure that those products are set up well before you, know, you go ahead and do larger orders. So I think that's kind of the biggest piece of consideration there is just, you know, there is a heightened risk and, you know, especially with quality control, it's an iterative process. So as you're going through the production orders, you're going through order number one, order number two, you know, your quality control processes improve over time. And in a general sense, they also, uh, your, your quality control gets, you know, lower risk more over the, the more orders you do. So uh, that's kind of like the key consideration aspects on the quality control side, um, especially with ordering larger orders. Uh, and then also, you know, obviously, uh, if you do larger orders, you want to make sure that you're getting more effective with the process, uh, because if you're ordering six months of inventory, you have more economies of scale. You need to be checking more units and you need to be making sure those inspections are done thoroughly. Uh, so that way you're not caught with surprises after the orders have shipped. Right. Um, and Jesse, you own, well, and James, you can um, chip in or um say something as well but uh jesse have you seen a huge difference recently in terms of people in need of uh warehouses yeah absolutely there's we get calls constantly um and people are, are panicking about their their restock limits um and just to kind of add to what uh Sajog had mentioned um when you you have a solid 3pl partner it gives you an additional fail safe so when your goods arrive You've got a solid 3PL partner. They're going to look at your goods. They're going to make sure that they're in the condition you need them to be in before they end up uh, at, at an Amazon fulfillment center, which is really crucial because it, it really could be too late once you find out that you know you start seeing negative product reviews and um, you realize that there's a huge problem you know with your product, which is also why you need a really solid inspections company on top of that. So um, you know both of those those. Uh, those aspects are really important. And when it comes to uh, the number of, of people that are that are moving towards warehousing, we hear it a lot. And and there's a lot of frustration around around Amazon in general, I think. Um, and you know, kind of moving towards FBM is is you know uh, fulfilled by merchant is something that's becoming more popular. People want to to have more control over their brand. They want to have contact with their customers directly. Um, and especially for for people who are who have tighter margins, um, it's it's important that that they're able to to kind of maintain some control over what it is they're selling and how much money they're they're making when they're getting nickel and dimed constantly. And and it's it it is a real frustration. And um, you know I think as you move as as sellers start moving towards FBM, they're realizing that they have less dependence on Amazon policies. Um, they have more flexibility and freedom. They're using it really just as a platform to sell on, on, in addition to other platforms that they're selling on. Um, there's less paperwork involved when it comes to taxes and non-sales tax states. Um, it gives them more control over their inventory. It's just general control over your business. And it seems to be that um, uh, it's, it's, it, it really is becoming more popular and the need for warehousing space is, is growing quickly and we're getting i mean we get calls every day uh from people who are who are frustrated with dealing with with their restock limits and 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 amazon and their fees and you know getting nickel and dimed so um 
I think in short, it's really important to have a really quality inspection team, a really high quality 3PL partner, and you need to maintain control over your brand. And if you do that, you're going to have happy customers and happy customers means more sales. So, James, are you kind of getting the same feedback as Jesse? Yeah, so um, obviously I don't know Jesse's personal experiences, but I can basically say almost everything he said is uh, obviously there's more people inquiring and stuff like that. But a few key areas that I think are interesting observations in our sense um, is one, we're seeing obviously more, more and more merchant fulfilled and also SFP, seller fulfilled prime. Um, people are getting curious about that program. Now I will be full disclaimer, uh, and this will be applicable to any 3PL. No one's going to match FBA's rates because they're just unbelievably cheap. But guess what? Would you rather sell nothing or would you rather sell something at a slightly higher cost? <laughs> it really comes down to your business. And hey, every product's going to be different as well. Some products make more sense. Um, another thing that we've also seen is, is getting 3PLs that understand Amazon. There's a lot of 3PLs out there, uh, but direct to consumer, pretty easy. Storage, pretty easy. But when it comes to Amazon, um, as we all know, there's so many different moving parts. There's requirements. Hey, if you send in a box of 26 inches, it's not oversized. You're going to get dinged for that. Well, most 3PLs would be, oh, a 26 inch box, whoop you do. But getting ones that understand Amazon is really, really important. And with that, and I'm sure Jesse also has um, some additional like benefits that he can provide Amazon sellers is saying, hey, because of our expertise, we can help out in these areas uh, like more efficient. So for example, uh, one of the ways we help is getting stuff to Amazon uh, checked in faster. So we do consolidated trucks, we do a variety of other things and little things like that. Well, shaving off a day or two doesn't sound like much, but when you multiply that out by all these different shipments, um, it can really add up. So uh, I encourage anyone, whether you curious anyone on the panel um, or any people listening, uh, feel free to reach out to me or Jesse. I'm sure Jesse would happily answer your questions as well. Um, mm -hmm. But just make sure you, when you reach out to a 3PL in general, um, make sure they understand the world of Amazon because the difference between a box label and I don't know if you use 2D barcodes or the shipping label or pallet labels. Well, all of those have different moving parts and hey, you can't put those over a seam. Well, little things like that can get you a ding on your seller account if you do it wrong. But for us and probably for Jesse, it's just natural and intuitive that we do that automatically. I'd like to piggyback on what James said about, you know, making sure that you're like cutting off those, cutting down on those two little days here and there, especially during Q4. You know, I know it seems early to be talking about Q4, but we need to talk about it now. It's going to come before we know it. It's going to last longer because of all of these, you know, think of how many glitches Amazon has been having lately. Uh, it's only going to get worse. And when we think about logistics of shipping your products in with these restock limits right now, if we can't get in on this amazing tip that Chelsea gave us on, um, you know, utilizing MCF and increasing our limits, we are going to have to rely on our logistics partners and we're going to have to keep track of our inventory. And one of the tips that Chelsea gave in a webinar the other day she did for us was never send everything in one shipment to Amazon. Because just the other day in our group, in our Facebook group, somebody posted that Amazon lost their entire shipment, over 20,000 units, and three other people posted below that and said they lost mine too. And that counts against your restock limits. So we all have to be smart about our logistics, about how we send products in, and we have to know, I think it's really smart to make sure that you have multiple ways to fulfill your inventory whether it's on multiple sales channels, whether it's you know on your website, on Walmart, on Amazon, on all the different sales channels, whether it's that or whether it that means sending in small parcel delivery and sending in um, LTL shipments as well, you know, and then maybe doing some merchant fulfilling on top of that from your 3PL, right? All of that is gonna keep you in stock and keep you selling through. And if you can't sell through, you're going to have even more limits on your restock. So just 
keep that in mind that during Q4, you need to make sure that not only are you seed feeding the beast and getting your inventory in there, but you're also keep not putting all of your eggs in one shipment basket. And you're also making sure you're utilizing multiple channels and that your 3PL knows something about something. Make sure there's a lot of 3PLs popping up lately, right? So make sure you're interviewing them, make sure you're using trusted resource providers. Um, but yeah, shipping during Q4, insane. Whether it's you know shipping to Amazon or, or this whole crazy shipping and logistics uh, nightmare that we're all going through right now. Yeah, so, I agree. I, I just wanted to add to that, um, that does include um, not putting everything on one boat. So like saving something for air, you don't wanna necessarily have to use air, but if the boat gets stuck in the Suez Canal, you have some way of shipping something over. We're dealing with that now. We had a two week delay. And so we are having to airship some extra inventory over and we had the foresight to withhold that inventory just in case. So that's something that should be in your system is that you know you never put everything on one boat, you never put everything on one LTL and you always have an FBM way to fulfill. Chelsea, you don't have to be absurd. There's no way that a ship could actually get stuck in the Suez Canal. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I want to add to now that it happened once, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's it's also it's also really important to note that you know, and I'm I'm saying this as a 3PL owner, um, and I'm sure you know James can can attest to it too. Uh, you should probably be using more than one 3PL as well. Um, you never know what's going to happen with your 3PL. If there's a fire in one of their warehouses, um, you know, you, you should, you should really just kind of always have uh, a fail safe just in case, um, across the board. So whether it be on a boat or a ship or a factory or 3PL, um, you should always, always have something to fall back on. And, and I'm going to attest to that because not only do I have a facility that has complete capacity to do kind of whatever I want. I have contacts across the U.S. who I can call up, and if I need a shipment there, typically it's geographic advantages. So, for example, I'm in Texas, but if I have stuff in New York, it may be more cost effective for me to send it to a friend of mine in New Jersey who has a warehouse just due to shipping costs. Now, this applies to private label, wholesale, basically everyone. Um, but even I, who has a warehouse, who's also a seller, have times and specific scenarios where it makes more sense for me to send to another facility. So obviously it's gonna take a while for you to establish presence in each, in each facility if needed and whatnot, but um, in finding really good facilities, um, I, I'll be honest, we're finding that there are facilities opening up and they run everything on paper. Not Google Sheets, not software, but literal notebooks. And I'm like, how <laughs> but um there are uh a lot of facilities out there do your vetting and stuff like that but he's very very right audit your facilities but also think about which facilities which backups do you have which redundancies because yeah there are things that maybe it's the 3pl's fault but what if a tornado hits what if a fire hits like that's not their fault but guess what? Insurance claims are not 24 hours a uh, turnaround. <laughs> so make sure you have that in place as redundancies. If last year wasn't an indicator for having backup plans and redundancies, I don't know what is. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I'd love to hear from you just in regards, because I mean, I think you of anyone here pretty much, you know, you have your foot in all the, um, logistics and Amazon side and Walmart side, all that stuff. So what would be your advice moving into Q4 regarding um, just pushing through, making sure it's successful, making sure you're avoiding bad um, reviews, um, making sure that you're not getting um, returns or complaints on late shipping. Is there any um, pearls of wisdom you can tell us? <laughs> I think uh, sure. I assume you're talking to me or are you talking to him? Him. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so I think that my advice is different now than it was two years ago. 
right? Two years ago, the infrastructure was not there to support doing this on our own. And FBA was amazing, right? You ship your stuff on in, you can ship it anywhere. It's quick, it's fast. They know what they're doing. But, and it's not just COVID, it's just the massive amount of um, demand that they have. They can't keep up with the demand. They can't hire warehouse workers because most of them are getting paid more to sit at home in unemployment right now. Um, not just Amazon and FBA, but also think about trucking. You know, truck drivers that were making 13, 14, 15 dollars an hour now to haul your stuff to an FBA center. A lot of them are sitting at home in unemployment right now. Or the ones that are left, they just they just can't haul it all, right? We're stuck. Um, there's a lot of reasons why the infrastructure that worked two years ago is not working as well now. So what I think, you know, just as general broad advice, pearls of wisdom, as you said, is start becoming more independent and self-sufficient. All right. I love Amazon. I tell everybody sell on Amazon, but don't be an Amazon seller. Be an e-commerce seller that sells on Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. So become platform agnostic. And if we're becoming platform agnostic, it means we need to become logistics agnostic too. We need to have lots of different options. As, as Amy said, don't put your eggs in one basket. As I wish you would have said, don't put all your eggs in one container, right? <laughs> uh, I love utilizing resources that are great, but always have a backup plan and a third plan. What I'm doing right now, and I used to just ship everything to FBA from China, and then I would ship it to other platform sales, my Shopify sales, my Walmart sales, whatever. Now I've stopped doing that. Everything comes to a 3PL or two 3PLs, right? I usually have multiple. And then I'll drip feed into FBA. I'll have merchant fulfilled listings turned on at the same time. So if they lose my crap, things automatically kick in. And then I'm no longer using Amazon for my other platform or marketplace sales either, right? Like they waffled on that a few times, said, yeah, we will do this. Now we won't do this. Now they say we will do it. The other platforms are like, screw you, Amazon. We don't want you shipping our crap, specifically Walmart. So make sure that you're utilizing, um, you know, uh, someone that can scale, that can ship to multiple platforms. Uh, don't just become dependent on one system. Another thing that I think is really cool is when it comes to logistics is this new wave of SaaS platforms that sit on top of physical logistics solutions, right? And this is something that's fairly new. You know, two or three years ago, we didn't really have all this stuff. We didn't have these these amazing tools that would do cool stuff. I like, um, when I'm talking about these these SaaS or software platforms, I'm thinking of like ShipBob and, and these different platforms that utilize a bunch of different logistics. I use uh, myfbaprep.com, right? Guy named Tom, and what he does is he built this SaaS platform that actually connects into, I think right now he's at 45 different warehouses. So if he accepts a shipment, that shipment actually automatically can get spread out to multiple platform or multiple warehouses, multiple uh, storage facilities. And then when I utilize a, a system like that for omni-channel, multi-channel fulfillment, then they can pull inventory out of the location that's closest to um, that buyer. You know, even we talk about Merchant Fulfilled, Merchant Fulfilled Prime. Like Merchant Fulfilled Prime is amazing if someone in the region where that inventory is parked is buying it. Like I, I was one of the first pilot users of Merchant Fulfilled Prime and I could only ship stuff within like the Southeast. I'm located in Alabama. Like if it were beyond the Mason Dixon line, essentially I couldn't do it because it would cost me just a freaking fortune. But then when I realized, hey, I can park a pallet of you know inventory in this state, this state, and this state, then it opened up my Merchant Fulfilled Prime ability because it wouldn't cost me an arm and leg to ship you know that two days. So um that that's one of my pieces of advice is, is don't become dependent on one system you know spread out a little bit but also um start utilizing some of these especially like software based platforms that are handling some of those tough restrictions or, or tough um solutions for you like spreading out among multiple different uh, fulfillment centers now you're you've been a huge advocate of walmart recently in fact you spoke about it at prosper um so for the audience listening, when you say, um, you know, be omni-channel, use different um, platforms to sell, right now as we're going into August and into rolling into Q4, if you are an Amazon seller, do you think now with all the backlog happening in supply chain in general, do you think now is a good time to venture into a different platform like Walmart or would you suggest waiting until after Q4 to do it? it? It's hard to make a blanket statement because everybody's situation is different. Here's what I think. Like I love being omnichannel, but I think too many people try to do it too fast. 
-hmm. you know, there are a lot of quote unquote Amazon sellers that are trying to do too much, right? They're trying to take on too much. They're getting so spread out. They're getting distracted. They're getting shiny object syndrome. If you're on your first product on Amazon and you need to be worried about optimizing your PPC, worry about optimizing your PPC. Don't be trying to figure out how to launch on Walmart. It's not the right time, right? It's just okay. not. Um, I love low hanging fruit, the 80, 20, you know, Pareto principle rule. Um, I spoke this morning to two guys that are eight figure sellers on Amazon. They're now seven figure sellers on Walmart, but they said, Hey, if we would even looked at Walmart for the first five years, we would have got distracted. Like, like there's a time and place to do it. So yes, I do believe that we need to stop being Amazon sellers and start being e-commerce sellers, but I still think Amazon right now is the easiest way to go. I don't think to answer your question more specifically, McLean, that like a Walmart is the solution to the logistics problems at Amazon. I think these are two different things. Like go to a different channel when you're ready to go to a different channel and it makes sense for you. But it's not a fix for Amazon's fulfillment system because honestly, it's all going to be a disaster, right? Right. Like even yeah. Walmart is pushing their WFS fulfillment, the Walmart fulfillment service. Um, right. It sucks. I. Yeah. Kid you not, I was on the phone with Walmart yesterday and I said, guys, I, it's terrible. They said, why is it terrible? I said, because you've got one center, like you've got one place you ship your stuff into in Kentucky. If I'm in Oklahoma, you're expecting me to ship my two pallets all the way to Kentucky to one fulfillment center that's overfilled too. Like it's garbage, yeah. you know, and I told them, I said, I advocate these third party, you know, these third party solutions. So, no, I don't I don't think that Walmart is the solution to the problems at Amazon. But I do think that if your company's growing, your brands are scaling, that Walmart is the place to be looking. And I look at all of them. But, you know, for some of the reasons like I talked about with um, at Prosper, you know, Amazon's logistics system is really hindered because they only have 150 ish fulfillment centers and they're all full. Walmart right now has one. They just opened one in New Jersey. They're about to open up two more in other cities. But Walmart has 10,500 physical stores. Think about that. They've got more square footage, more floor space, more trucks, more truck drivers, more laborers than any other company out there. Right. So right now, Walmart's getting caught up, but I think they're going to be the fastest to scale and they're going to be the fastest to adopt, um, you know, the the demands of these Amazon type e-commerce sellers. So, no, Walmart's not the solution for Q4. But separately, you better start thinking about something like Walmart because it will be the biggest competition to Amazon. Um, for us in a very, very short period of time, if not already. Just like awesome. To talk about Walmart really quick on uh, the Kentucky facility is their crosstalk facility. Um, they do have a, lar uh, a decent quantity of warehouses spread throughout the United States that they use for the actual fulfillment. Yeah, yeah, just inbound. That's And, and I just heard their New Jersey facility starting to accept some inbound but it's just getting started. So it's crazy. These, these guys that I talked to, they're out on the West Coast. They have to ship their product from the West Coast to Kentucky, and then Walmart takes and ships it back to a distribution center on the West Coast. <laughs> so it takes like three like weeks and it costs a fortune. <laughs> I would love to just add one more, not, not about Walmart. Um, I've been on Walmart for a year now and it's, it's okay. It's a channel, you know, but, uh, you know, but I agree with Tim, it's going to grow. Uh, but I, I do want to just circle back, um, two things that I included in my talk when I was talking about preparing for logistics and all of that, that I didn't mention yet. And I think that these things are important things for people to pay attention to on the other side of the pond <laughs> is, relationships and contracts with your suppliers. So, you know, it as Sajog mentioned, you know, inspections right now are going to be more important than anything because your suppliers in most cases are overwhelmed. And um, that same supplier that you maybe first ordered your product from and it was really great, they may have gone through some serious manpower changes. Um, China is changing constantly. And, you know, it used to be I'd walk through factories in China, and I know that Tim has experience with this as well, but um, I wouldn't see a, an e-commerce department, right, where they were selling their products on these e-commerce channels. Now, it's very rare to not find a full-up e-commerce department. Factories are really focused on selling their own goods direct to market. Um, and so if you have someone else 
making your products for you, unless you're manufacturing yourself, you need to focus on if you want if you want to get that six months of inventory out the door and you want to make sure that things go well and that you know if your inspection fails that you have a, a good way ahead to fix that um, those problems you need to work on building relationships with your suppliers talking to them finding out what is going on in their world telling them what your projections are encouraging them to work with you uh, and then making sure that you have good business contracts in place with your suppliers. So if you don't have anything in writing, you need to be thinking about that. Contracts cover the timelines in which your stuff is produced. So make sure that number one, you're not skipping inspections. I don't care if, the, if every single time you order that uh, it's been perfect and you've never had a problem that doesn't mean you're not gonna have a problem next time, especially with all the increased demand on your suppliers. So make sure you're ordering inspections and make sure on big orders like that, especially that you're ordering inspections, but make sure you're building those relationships with your suppliers, giving them your projections, making sure that you have good contracts with those suppliers um, because it's gonna become more important than ever as we're all fighting to get our stuff done and out the door on time. I just wanted to add that because it's really and, important. And on top of that, it, well, you know, Amy mentioned the importance of maintaining relationships with your suppliers, maintaining relationships with your 3PL. The number one most important relationship that you're going to have, and I'm sure, I mean, we're, we're all business people, is relationship with your customer. And that's largely being lost uh, through a lot of these, these, um, you know, these different selling channels. Um, it's one of the benefits of of uh, of, of using um, fulfilled by by merchant. I mean, it gives you a chance to communicate. Customer service goes a really really long way today, and it doesn't take a whole lot of effort. Um, so, what you know, I, I just kind of thought that that was something that gets they, it kind of gets lost when talking about logistics and and selling channels. Uh, but it's definitely something to pay attention to. Yeah, I'd like to give Pearl a little time since we're coming up on the hour and I uh, just kind of want to give her the platform right now or <laughs> Thank you. I, I honestly the, the amount of knowledge that I learned personally has been fascinating. I'm gonna have the entire office listen to this after it's been amazing oh, good. Honestly. Yeah. So I, I guess uh, you know, so let me just uh, point out, you know, what our specialty is and why I'm gonna be able to you know feed some information and maybe you know share some some data that we're getting our specialty is helping sellers ship into amazon's international markets not into the u.s market so markets like amazon uk amazon canada especially for fba that's our that's our niche um, by a small parcel so what we do see over the last two weeks is that canada has pretty much um i can't say taken away every restriction but for the most part it's been much, much better. And almost, I would say, a good 60% more of shipments than people were able to ship, you know, since March. So I hope it's the same for, you know, many of you over here if you're selling on Canada. Um, but just to, you know, put a little bit of light uh, at the end of the tunnel, things are definitely much better. Um, based on our data, we do have a few hundred shippers per day. So we could say very confidently that that is happening. And of course, you know, we're following up with sellers individually based on the size of their shipment to confirm is this actually happening and it's happening. So thank God for that. Um, and I do want to say for the UK as well, the UK is definitely, definitely loosening up. So it looks like there's a little bit of a difference between what the restock limits are about in the US then versus what's been, you know, in the UK and in Canada. For the UK and Canada, it does seem like it was much more COVID related versus space related. And as restrictions are dropping, Amazon is able to handle more, more loads and they're able to get more, more staff and, you know, open back up their fulfillment centers, especially like in Brampton. Brampton is, you know, one of the biggest hubs that Amazon has in Canada. And that's where they've been hit the most and things are definitely open much more. So it's definitely definitely opening back up. So hopefully we hope this trend continues, but for us, it's been a tremendous relief. You know, me personally listening to sellers on a daily basis, literally telling me like, Pearl, I'm going to have to fire half my staff. I'm going to have to let people go. It's been painful to listen to that. And, 
you know, being able to be at the show last night and, you know, hearing again from people saying, yeah, it's much better and things are definitely looking up. You know, it's, it's, it's really, it's really great to hear that. So I definitely want to share that with the audience. So I, I do want to add that the small parcel way is definitely been something that has been a huge saver for people. And I know Amy, you mentioned it at Tim and James, all of you mentioned that the smaller shipments is what is definitely the key to get things um, into Amazon right now and the faster turnover. So we found that with the carriers like DHL, UPS and FedEx, which we're partners of, and that's you know the services that we offer at the much discounted rates of let's say going directly with them, again, for international shipping, we found that that has been a huge key factor in people being able to keep their stock in check. And another interesting thing along the line of that, what sellers have brought out to me, and it's it's pretty cool that you know I was able to back it up and actually share this information with others. And I could say confidently that this has been working for most sellers that we've shared it with, that basically what they've been doing is calling into the FBA team and more specifically, they ask to speak to the captive team. I'm sure that you guys are well seasoned and you know what that means, but basically speaking to the American team at Amazon and saying, I need to get more inventory in. And they ask specifically for a 25% increase in space. And if Amazon gives it to you, which in most cases sellers were able to, and they utilize the full amount of space Amazon gave them right away, they automatically got an increase the next week. And again, this hasn't been working for everybody, but for most sellers that we've shared this bit, bit of information, it has worked. And continuously, week after week, if they are utilizing the full space that Amazon granted the first time they made that phone call to the FBA team through the captive team, it has worked. So, um, you know, if any of you guys, you know, care more about this and if you could share that, that would be amazing. Um, but I have had heard this from a few um high level seller so i know that it's working and hopefully it will continue and uh, i do want to mention two more things and then i'll wrap it up um because of the restock limits other marketplaces people are looking for other options right work we send in stock we've seen the singapore marketplace has been crazy hot right now especially with health and beauty product people obviously are you know into those things over there they are very wealthy um, individuals that, that live there, they like the better things in life. And the good thing is that compliance wise, it's very easy for us to help you get the proper licenses to be able to sell those things. Because a lot of times when you're going internationally, when it comes to customs, these things could become very difficult. So we found that people trying to utilize, where can I send my stock in? Singapore has been a very hot marketplace right now. We've seen, you know, based on data, very large shipments going there. And the same for Japan. Japan does not have any inventory limits right now. There are no restock limits for the most part, um, confirmed with Amazon actually, and also a very hot marketplace. So health and beauty is a little bit more difficult because the rules over there with customs are you know, a little bit more stringent, but definitely with other, market, with other uh, categories like kitchen stuff, for example, people are actually killing it there right now. So yeah, I just wanted to give out this information and um, yeah, that's it. Can I uh, ask a quick question about um, what you said about utilization? You said they yeah. utilize the limits. By utilize, do you mean they fill them up or they sell through? So they send in the full amount that Amazon gave them. Mm -hmm. They got without a 20 selling, without having to sell through. Right, right. That was the first step. So they could have sell through in a week, right? So whatever right. Amazon gave them, obviously they have to keep up with a sell through for Amazon to continue doing this. It's not, this is relatively new information. I got this about a week ago, but the point was that they could actually ship it in. What happens after, hopefully they could continue selling through. And you know, what other sellers have been saying is that what they'll do is they'll use that space that they're given for something like a cheap, fast item. So they could just keep the sell through rate going. So mm -hmm. they'll, you know, they'll try to hit it from both sides. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Awesome. I have a couple of quick questions from the audience. So uh, the first question here, uh, with the new MFN uh, seller for full prime metric requirements for one day shipping, is there a recommendation on balancing what product should go to FBA versus what product should go to MFN or seller for full prime?
feel free to chime in, anybody. <laughs> Well, I think as Tim mentioned about Seller Fulfill Prime, it depends what your fulfillment capabilities are with that product. So one of the mistakes that people make with Seller Fulfill Prime, which let's just talk about Seller Fulfill Prime for a minute. It's a really great option because you still get the Prime Batch. Over Merchant Fulfilled, you know many people, over 80% of the American public is Prime members. So you know, by just Merchant Fulfilling, you don't get that Prime Batch. But if you sign up for Seller Fulfilled Prime, you do get that Prime badge and it's and then you show up for those Prime ready searches, which is really great and can make a difference in your Merchant Fulfilled orders, okay? But the problem is a lot of people will sign up for Seller Fulfilled Prime because once you start Merchant Fulfilling, Amazon will send you a little offer, hey, you wanna sign up, right? Um, but if you can't fulfill it in time, you could take a major ding on your seller account, right? And, and that's not good. So what I would recommend is if you've never done Seller Fulfilled Prime before, do exactly what Tim recommended. And that's where you, you just do it locally, like in your region where you have control of one of your products, right? Um, and then grow over time. As you know, like, okay, it's good if you're working with more than one 3PL and they have strategic locations and you've, you've got a good relationship with them and they're already doing a good job regular merchant fulfilling for you and you talk with them and you make sure they can fulfill within that two-day window, right? Uh, then start adding your other products in. So I would just recommend, that's my advice, start small, fulfill, make sure it's good to go, then talk with your logistics providers to expand it and um, and slowly expand into more of your products. Awesome, thanks for that. And another question, uh, this one is uh, more on the shipping side. Uh, so Pearl, this might be your area of expertise. Uh, so um, someone in the audience mentioned that air freight is very close to ocean freight now uh, as far as pricing. So just kind of curious in terms of like what the differences look like in pricing between ocean and air. And is it recommended to just start shipping air then? Good question. It's funny because someone literally asked me that question last night. It's still it's still about eighteen thousand. Like I said, now it's going to be about eighteen thousand a container. We don't offer sea freight, so I'm just giving you the market rate that I know the the you know basic rate. But to bring in a full container by air is still going to cost you forty fifty thousand dollars. So no, the answer is it's still cheaper by sea, unfortunately. But um, smaller shipments, like what Chelsea said earlier, I would recommend you know bringing in just to have that stock and keep the turnover going using a you know forwarder or getting rates through with DHL things like that. Um, but still, C by far is going to be cheaper. Awesome. And then uh, another question uh, from the audience. Uh, this one's for Tim, Amy, um, and specifically and myself as well as anybody else who would like to chime in. Uh, but um, this is from the audience, this is a new seller. Uh, so hi, I like your advice, I'm a new seller. We're about to start the first production in two weeks. Is this a bad time? Should we wait for next year or should we still go ahead with production? Awesome, I'll just chime in real quick uh, for that. So in terms of uh, moving into production, as we build into Q4, uh, we're gonna see production increase pretty dramatically. Uh, so that's kind of generally what it looks like. So when we move into like August, September, October, uh, we start to see production quantities increase quite a bit preparing for Q4. Uh, but just because of the freight disruptions we've been seeing, I think that a lot of that um, heavy traffic is going to come a little bit earlier this year than later. So it's kind of like a little bit of a gamble uh, when it comes to like when you want to start production. So you know you could wait a couple of weeks, you could wait a couple of months and start production later in the year. Uh, but then you know you have delayed your production a couple of months. So you know if you're launching and you want to you know wait until next year, uh, you know you're going to lose six months, and that's six months of lost profit, six months of you know lost sales, and six months of lost traction. So my recommendation would be to just get started uh, and talk with your suppliers. I think you know just building a relationship with your suppliers is really beneficial. So asking your suppliers specifically because every product, every niche, every industry is very different. So talking with your suppliers, understanding, you know, what their commitments look like right now, what their production lines look like, uh, you know, and how much traffic they have and when they can fit in your production, you know, based on your MOQ or the number of units you're ordering. I think understanding that from your suppliers will be a great, um, you know, resource uh, versus, you know, the panel here 
uh, just because of every production is so different. And then using that as kind of a baseline to determine, okay, hey, you know, maybe I should start my production later on. Uh, but, you know, 3PLs, they all exist. They're all here. Freight still exists. And, uh, you know, if you order earlier and you have time to wait for sea freight, it's still going to be cheaper, as Pearl mentioned, than air freight. So, you know, starting earlier and getting things moving earlier is going to generally yield you better circumstances and better results than waiting, especially till next year. One thing I'll add to that, I love your advice, Sajag. I agree. You, you, there's no better time than now. It's still, it's like having a kid. You know, there's, there's never a perfect time. Like you just gotta move, right? Did you but, say it's like having a kid? Yeah, there's no perfect time to have a kid. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I beg but, to differ. Um, I have three. I beg to differ. <laughs> I the time of the year was very different. I beg to differ. Um, <laughs> But, you know, there's there's no there's not really is such a thing as like a perfect timing when you're starting a new business. You just have to move forward. So I agree on that. What I will caution you to do if you are a new seller, though, is pay extra attention to your numbers right now because <laughs> we are outside of normal shipping costs. It's really, really crazy. Um, and you want to make sure that you have the margin to grow this product that you're about to launch. Um, and you know, maybe you, you know or you don't know, launching costs money. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's, you're not going to make a whole bunch of profit during a launch. Most of us do not, right? We grow our sales, we grow our traffic, we grow our marketing, growing your marketing costs money in the beginning. So just note, if you're, note what, get some shipping quotes and see what your price is going to be after shipping. Because many times shipping right now is costing more than the product itself. So make sure that you have enough margin. A lot of the programs out there teach just a 30% margin and it's not enough. It's not enough, especially not with shipping right now. So I'm not trying to discourage you. I think you should move forward, but I think you should run your numbers, get several shipping quotes, look at what your numbers are going to be and where your profit margin is. And that way, you know, you can plan your launch accordingly and um, and really understand because during Q4, especially if you're going to launch during Q4, every, all the prices go up. Your assessed storage fees every 30 days at Amazon, um, it, you know, there's a lot more delays in shipping and marketing and advertising costs go up as well because there's more competition during Q4 and more traffic. So just run your numbers and, and know that very well so that as you're going into it, you're not surprised and you're not like, oh my gosh, you know, I lost so much money. Um, that would be my add-on advice. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks so much, everybody. So I just want to quickly give everybody a chance to just run through um, how the audience uh, can reach you as well as uh, any special offers and a little bit about your guys' companies. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Oh, let me start it from the start. We will start with the current slide. Uh, so Amy, if you want to just kick off and go first, and we'll just go down the list. Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Amy Weiss from AmazingAtHome.com, and we help private label sellers on the path from concept all the way to launch. So we have product photography, listing optimization, um, and marketing and coaching services, as well as courses in a mastermind group to help private label sellers on their journey. So you can visit me anytime at amazingathome.com or you can send me an email, amy at amazingathome.com. All right, Chelsea. All right. Um, yeah, I'm Chelsea Cohen and I am the co-founder of SoStock.com. We are a an inventory management software and uh, we're built by and for Amazon sellers. And you can reach me at uh, at sostocks.com forward slash connect. That's all my socials. You can check out the software. Um, you can do a uh, book a live demo. And then also my email, chelsea at sostocks.com. Jesse. Sorry, I was muted. Um, so <laughs> we are a 3PL. We're 3PL Zen. Um, we specialize in e-commerce fulfillment. And uh, our main focus is uh, customer service so we're always available our phones ring to a manager all the time so you can always reach us um, so feel free to reach out jesse at 3plzen.com um, and uh, we'll be happy to chat with you all right james you're up 
Awesome. Well, thank you guys for having me on the webinar. <laughs> um, my name is James McConnell. I've been a ton of marketplace prep to kind of bring economies of scale to the 3PL world, for, especially for e-commerce, Amazon. We do just about everything, prep, fulfillment, um, case forwarding, storage, you name it. We can do, I can do manufacturing and stuff like that. And like I said, we try to focus on the economies of scale things. So for example, we've got consolidated trucks that check into Amazon next day. We've got equipment and all that stuff. Um, to kind of bring uh, efficiency to a large number of sellers without every seller having to go get a warehouse. <laughs> nice. Uh, TJ. Yep, so my name's Tim Jordan. The best the best way to find out about me, you can go to um, uh, whoistimjordan.com. There's a bunch of stuff listed there. You can also check out uh, my free Facebook group, Private Label Legion, um, just free free Facebook group. And mostly I just focus on being as cool as Amy and Chelsea. It's kind of what I do every day. So struggling, it's tough, but uh, but one day, maybe, maybe. And Ms. Pearl. Okay, hi everybody. I'm Pearl McLean, thanks for having me. Uh, so I'm with First Choice Shipping. Our specialty is to help sellers expand to Amazon's international markets using the FBA model. We help you from A to Z, from product compliance to VAT registration or NRI registration. Uh, we introduce you to an Amazon rep. If you're eligible, we work very closely with Amazon. We actually are Amazon's number one recommended provider for international expansion. So anywhere that you would love to expand to, like Amazon UK, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Australia, Singapore, and UAE, we can make it happen. And um, you can reach out to me at paffirstchoiceship.com or pearlaffirstchoiceship.com. And I will be so happy to help you. And the big man of the hour, Sajag. Awesome. Yeah, so I'm the founder of Movly. Movly gives you a full service quality control team for the cost of inspections. So we do quality control inspections right now, mainly in China. Uh, so if you guys are producing any products and you're looking to get it inspected, visit us at movly.com. And we have a really awesome Help Me Prepare guide. Uh, just uh, click Help Me Prepare, put in your information. We give you a 20-page guide with questions to ask your suppliers and how to prepare for an inspection if it's your first time, as well as uh, if you get started, you can get connected with the service pod and uh, start booking inspections. Awesome. Well, I thank you all for um, taking up an hour of your day to be with us. I thought the content you all provided was stellar. I hope the audience got a lot out of it. Um, uh, to the audience, this is a recorded event, so I will make sure that it gets sent out to anyone that had to leave early or that wasn't able to make it or that wants to review it again. So um, thank you, everyone. I hope you all have a good day. Thank you. Awesome. Take Thanks, care, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.